you know, there are certain ways to show that software, including AI, is is patentable. And one of the big ones um, is to show an improvement to an underlying machine. So if we can show in our claims and in our patent, when we write it, that there is an improvement to um, the underlying device, let's say, by improving its predictive nature or perhaps the AI uh, related software, the invention, the inventive portion of it allows the underlying machine to use less processing power or less memory or you know, there's some type of distributed nature to it. We can, stri- we can describe all of that in order to demonstrate that improvement and to show that it is uh, a technical invention and something more than just doing it on a, on a processor like the uh, Supreme Court um, said that we shall not do. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy! Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today on the show, we have Ryan Phelan. Ryan is a registered U.S. patent attorney and partner at the intellectual property law firm of Marshall, Gernstein, and Boren, LLP. He works with everything from startups to Fortune 500 companies to develop and protect their innovations and businesses with IP. He holds an MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management and is a former technology consultant at Accenture. Companies routinely work with him in a variety of technical areas and industries, including medical devices, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the Internet of Things. He is honored to have been published in several prestigious IP publications and has been invited to speak at many IP conferences. He is also the founder of Patent Next, a patent and IP law blog focusing on next generation and new age technologies. And finally, he is an adjunct professor at the Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law, teaching coursework on patenting software inventions in the United States. You're one busy guy, Ryan. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. Thank you, Justin. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, so I know much of the topics today are going to be around artificial intelligence and intellectual property. But before we get there, I'm usually curious to ask our guests, you know, what was the path and maybe your interest growing up that got you into this profession and and where you are today? Sure. Well, first of all, even from a very early age, like so many of us, I had a passion for technology, anything that, you know, blinked or, you know, made an interesting sound. I'd be looking at it, taking it apart and and things like that. So I'm certainly one of those types of people. Throughout my life, I've always targeted that type of stuff. Went to college, was interested in electrical engineering and computer science, uh, primarily from high school days. This would have been in the the 90s when web browsing and, and HTML and stuff like that was kicking off. So basically followed that lead into college, did a little EE and then went full tilt into computer science after I learned how to program and code. And so from there, things got increasingly technical and, and more interesting for me. For sure. And it sounded like you ended up at you know, Accenture. I guess, what, what was your role there? Sure. I was a financial IT consultant at Accenture, where I was working on Wall Street some of the time and in Chicago in the derivatives market, uh, others of the time, flying back and forth from Chicago to New York, doing a lot of very interesting trading algorithms for clients, uh, such as Goldman Sachs and whatnot like that. And so usually fintech is probably one rung below perhaps you know, rocket science in that you know it has to be very uh, precise and very fast and efficient because you're literally talking about the difference between several milliseconds costing or making hundreds of thousands of dollars depending on the, the size of the trade. Things are very technical, object-oriented, multi-threaded, processing, you know, all of these concepts. It was kind of like the big data before big data was a word. And so those were the types of things that I was doing um, at Accenture using my uh, computer science degree that I got in college. It was a fun time. Excellent. Yeah. So I've worked on a number of large scale systems and I think you have a new appreciation for, uh, you know, when you're using them as a user on the outside, ha- having to understand a lot of the complexities that happens, you know, on the back end, even something as you might say as simple as an auction site like eBay, you know, back in the day, just the amount of throughput and traffic that these sites have to take on. And you're right, everything is very timed very precisely that one mistake or, or something like that can cost a lot of money. So really, really fun stuff to work on for sure. Challenging aspect of the world. At some point, you must have gotten involved in law then, obviously, right? So was that a passion of yours sort of like growing up or intellectual property? I guess, how do you work through this transformation? 
Sure. So at Accenture, as a consultant, of course, you're going to be exposed to um, legal issues that come up uh, from time to time. Uh, one of those was uh, IP. And it was fascinating to me seeing the overlap with you know, IP. How can you protect these interesting systems that you're developing, let's say, you know, on Wall Street or otherwise? Because, you know, like you just said, Justin, there's a, a lot of complexity that goes on behind the scenes of the various programs that are developed nowadays, and especially was true back then. And, you know, the thought was like, you know, wow, look at all this time and effort that's going into developing these complex systems. You know, surely there's an interest in protecting this work product. And so, you know, the answer to that, of course, in the U.S. and, and outside of the U.S. too, is intellectual property, including, you know, patents, trademarks, copyrights, things like this. And, you know, having seen the other side of the table, you know, ask questions about that, I became curious and, you know, started looking at, at law school. Interesting. Cool. And how long did it take you to get through that? So I was a, a bit different in my approach to that. I did Northwesterns, at least at the time, they had a different a joint program called a JD MBA program, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a combination of you, you get your JD and your MBA all packed in though within three years, typically to get a JD, which is a legal degree in the US. It takes three years alone. Uh, an MBA takes two years, but Northwestern had figured out a way by combining some summer material and, and having some of the classes overlap with credits that you could achieve both degrees within that three-year time period. And so it was a busy yet fun time where I took off my engineering slash computer hat for a little while and you know went into a newer direction in the JD and MBA space. Uh, I wanted to get the MBA in case I, you know, for whatever reason, I wanted to go back to Accenture and keep, you know, wearing that same consulting hat. The MBA would, would help kind of, you know, break some, some ceilings as far as, you know, trajectory on the consulting path was concerned. But at the same time, it would allow me to explore the IP on the JD side, which I, I certainly did. And since being sitting here as an attorney today, we can see, you know, which one of those was more interesting, although I still enjoy the, the business side as well. Uh, you still dabble in code at all? You just still write things or kind of largely out of that? I absolutely do still write code a lot. In fact, the last time I wrote code was this morning. I woke up after having written code last night to run something that I wrote and, and debug it this morning. So, you know, not surprisingly, the code that I write is still in the financial realm. I like to program computers mainly using Python nowadays, it's such a, a nice and simple language to do financial related projects, uh, such as trading my own money. And so I have several different projects right now that I write, uh, mainly communicating with interactive brokers to trade stocks and option strategies. So that's, that's one of my hobbies that I do when I can. It's still fun for me. I like it. It also keeps me up to speed on the technologies that are coming out, which there are quite a many nowadays. Yeah, for sure. You sort of live at this area, I guess, in the middle between kind of the same area that, that I love is, you know, artificial intelligence and, and Internet of Things. And, you know, you're obviously coming at it from an IP standpoint. I think most people listening to this maybe don't know what it takes for something to be patentable. Like what are the I guess we'll sort of break it down to sort of law school 101. But when we're talking about intellectual property. I guess, what does form intellectual property? That's maybe like, maybe that's my first question. Is it just something as simple as trademarks and patents? Maybe there's more to that. And then maybe a follow-up question is, is yeah, what, what makes something patentable? Sure, I'll tackle those in reverse order and kind of flow through it like that. So, you know, first of all, the, the four big IP rights in the US are uh, patents, trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets. And so they each protect uh, different things. So a patent will protect an idea it's usually the broadest coverage for IP. Copyright will protect expression of something that's, quote unquote, in a, a tangible medium, recorded in a tangible medium, you know, such as poem written on a, a napkin uh, is a, a very simple example. Or, you know, a, some code stored on a piece of RAM or ROM chip. It's very narrow in that it protects only that specific expression um, as written down. A trademark will protect uh, the source of a good or signal, such as the Apple logo is very famous. And when you see the Apple logo, you recognize that that is a, a product or, or something from Apple, which in your mind, in my mind, has you know, a certain quality or type. And then finally, a trade secret is something that protects information that is kept secret by a person or an entity, such as a company. As long as they keep that material secret, then they can hold on to those rights. And each of these different forms of IP has their own statutory law and case law that has been developed 
in the US where, you know, if you abide by those, then you can achieve IP protection for your product, your service, or, you know, what have getting into to patents specifically, for example, we have in the US 35 USC or United States Code or Title 35, which covers uh, patents. And if you look at the statute language in Section 101, which is one of the, the first sections in that in Title 35, it tells us what in fact is patentable in the US. And it's, it's four broad categories of things. And those four broad categories of things are processes, machines, manufacturers, or compositions of matter. And so in the computing world, three of those are interesting and, and one is not so interesting. So a process, of course, is you know, what we would think of as a running computer program in the computing world. A machine is, let's say, the system, let's say if you have computer code on a particular device, such as like a, an Apple iPhone or something like that running, we can protect an invention as the entirety of the system. And then an article of a manufacturer could be something like a ROM or RAM disk that can hold code. And so that's the third of the things that we can use uh, for protecting software inventions. The last one, the composition of matter is not so interesting to us because that usually protects biochemical type invention. I see. So yeah, competition matter, you're probably getting into the actual, uh, the atoms, I guess, maybe the, the pieces of it. When it comes to AI and, you know, internet of things, there's been a question I know you and I talked about before, like, is this technology even patentable? Is there enough of a differentiator in these spaces that you're talking about to actually say that, yes, this is something that could be patented? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of questions I'll get from you know, computer scientists and others in the computing space interested in patenting AI or other software inventions is, can we patent software inventions nowadays? The real reason why that question is asked is because of a Supreme Court case that came up in 2014. Before this case, it was known, at least since 1995, you know, from another Supreme Court case, that computer-related inventions were in, indeed patentable. And you know, many, many software-related patents uh, were filed and obtained from that case in 1995 forward to at least 2014, where we saw a reversal of sorts from the Supreme Court in a case called Alice versus CLS Bank, where the court came down with a new decision. And for those listening, the Supreme Court, you know, some of those on the podcast may or may not know that Supreme Court is the highest court of the land in the U.S. Probably many people know that. And below the Supreme Court is, of course, lower courts. There is a specialized court in the U.S. called the Federal Circuit, which is the court right underneath the Supreme Court that is specialized in hearing patent cases. So all appeals from district court, which are the lowest courts in the land, flow up to the Federal Circuit and those flow up to the Supreme Court. And so the Supreme Court, when it comes out with a decision, that decision is binding on not only the Federal Circuit that hears the specialized patent cases, but also all district courts across the U.S. and all 50 states. And so it Anytime there's a Supreme Court decision, you know, just like as we see on the news, it has an impact. It sends shockwaves um, throughout the, the patenting community, just like it does whenever, you know, we're seeing any other Supreme Court decision that comes down. This uh, case that happened in 2014, Alice basically looked at a patent that was very broad, that was in the financial world. It had to do with a ledger system where um, third party intermediaries would provide debits and credits or shore up debits and credits for parties uh, transacting on either sides in a monetary sense. And so what the court said, and the claims were very high level and business written, and they didn't mention anything technical such as a processor or memory or anything like this. They uh, were strictly um, written in a business sense of distributing funds among and between the parties for purposes of facilitating that uh, distribution between the intermediary. And the, the court took issue with that and basically said that these types of claims are abstract, and that's the big word. They're too abstract. We can't have these abstract claims that uh, preclude others in the computing space from doing something similar because all of these claims are just simply claim, you know, traditional business methods that say nothing more than do it on a computer. And so therefore, the court did not want to give a patent, which is essentially a monopoly. All patents are monopolies granted to the owner for a 20-year term to exclude others from practicing that invention if they so want. So the, the court basically said, we don't want to give somebody that power to exclude others from practicing this type of invention with such abstract level claims. And so all that said, from that point, uh, district courts reading the Supreme Court decision in Alice started taking an ax to some of these earlier patents in the computer space that were broadly written and 
could be determined to be abstract and invalid. And if your patent is found to be abstract, then it can be found invalid and therefore would be rendered useless by virtue of that. That's kind of a, a change in 2014 from based on that Alice decision that we have to be careful about. However, said that, you know, since 2014, we're now sitting here in 2021, there are many, many court decisions that have gone the other ways. And we now are ways of making claims not abstract, or in other words, patent eligible. We can discuss ways of doing that in this podcast. Interesting. So that, that software in general, like you were sort of talking about, as I'm thinking through this, like, can we tie it back to anything related to artificial intelligence, you know, specifically? Underneath a lot of this stuff is our algorithms, right? That, that's kind of what's sort of the crux of what's going on. Google, Microsoft, you know, Facebook, everyone's trying to build the best algorithm that they possibly can to make their machine learning as best as it possibly can. I don't know if I have a question here yet. I'm just sort of like maybe regurgitating or trying to, you know, understand that in 2014, kind of these, these changes happened where it was like we had things that were deemed patentable in the past were likely going to be harder to be patentable, right? Because in general, they were really sort of cutting off other inventions. Is that sort of true to say? Yeah, absolutely. And so there's been quite the uphill battle from, from then in 2014 to now to figure out you know, how you go about patenting software-related inventions. And you're correct, of course, that AI, because it's a software-related invention, we have to think about AI in those terms as well. And I'll back up a little bit and I'll say that the, the courts, including the federal circuit, which is kind of that junior court right below the Supreme Court, has issued some cautionary statements saying things such as, this Alice case with you know, abstractness could be a real issue for future technologies that you know, we want to make sure that we allow our inventors in the U.S. to protect. One of those uh, they specifically called out as being artificial intelligence. So there's a real concern, even by the courts, to somehow make sure that new inventions, AI, is a protectable asset in the U.S. despite the Alice decision. And the Supreme Court has punted a few times on decisions that could have clarified the matters because with the Supreme Court, what it does is it, it can only hear adversarial matters, meaning that two parties are in a dispute of some type and they render a decision and then that decision can be used as a, a backplate to allow other parties to understand what the rule or how that rule would be interpreted. So that the Supreme Court has not yet done this since Alice, which is frustrating. Congress has thought that it would act in certain circumstances to overrule Alice by making a statutory change, but they have yet to do so. All that said, you know, there are certain ways to show that software, including AI, is, is patentable. And one of the big ones is to show an improvement to an underlying machine. Okay. So if we can show in our claims and in our patent, when we write it, that there is an improvement to the underlying device, let's say, by improving its predictive nature or perhaps the AI-related software the inventive portion of it allows the underlying machine to use less processing power or less memory or, you know, there's some type of distributed nature to it. We can describe all of that in order to make it, to demonstrate that improvement and to show that it is a technical invention and something more than just doing it on a processor like the uh, Supreme Court said that we should, we shall not do. Gotcha. Sure. That begs the question, and I think you and I have talked about is, you know, could an algorithm actually be an inventor? So if there's some, this algorithm kicks out something that maybe humans haven't seen before, could an AI be listed as a inventor on a patent? Not under current statutory law. So this actually came up not too long ago where uh, there was a, a DABIS initiative by a professor, Stephen Thaler, in the U.S., and he invented a creativity machine. And this creativity machine would come up with what we think of as inventions in the patenting realm, which the standard for determining whether someone is inventor is if they con contributed to the conception of a claim, which it refers to a patent claim. And the patent claims is just nothing more than a listing of what the invention is made of. And so for an AI-related invention or a software-related invention, it would usually touch on the steps of the software that's running. Like, you know, perhaps some information is received over a network and then the information is used to compute. You know, maybe that information is training data and the training data is used to train an AI-related model and then the model is used to make a prediction or something like this. And so, you know, the, the inventor would be someone, a person that conceived of those particular elements of that invention. And so what Stephen Thaler did is he, for the first time ever, 
it indicated on his patent application that Dabas, a machine, was the inventor. Usually you would list a human as an inventor, but he listed a machine and this created issues at the patent office here in the US. He also filed in other countries and jurisdictions, including the UK and in Europe and um, others. And basically what all of these countries, including the US said, is they look to their statutory law and the way that the law is currently written is that it's it includes words such as whoever invents or the person that invents and, and things like this. And so the patent office must follow the that code that we talked about earlier, the Title 35 of the US code. And when they looked at that, they said, well, the, the statutory law is written clearly contemplates a person or a human inventor. And so therefore, your application is defective by virtue of not listing a human. And so they, they requested him to actually list one. He did not, citing reasons you know, that he could not list it because he did not invent it. He wasn't an inventor. And so therefore, they denied his application. And so what myself and others in the legal community think now is that if there is to be a AI inventor or an inventor that could at least be listed on a patent application, it require a statutory change, which would have to come from Congress in order to change those words, in order to allow an AI to be listed um, as an inventor. So right now, things are still in flux with that. There's certainly been questions whether that should be done and to what extent. And uh, other countries have come out uh, the same way, including Japan, uh, China, and Europe all have similar statutory code that precludes AI-related inventors. And that's merely a function of the laws, uh, how they have been written. Usually the law lags technology by a good 10 to 20 years, which is the case here. Yeah, interesting. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. One could argue, well, whoever programmed the algorithm maybe would actually be the inventor of it. But some of these things are, you just don't know where they come from, right? I mean, I would think it would be difficult to point to an inventor if it's actually the machine generating the results. I think of something like GPT-3, which is basically, you know, it's creating its own words, right? It's, it can actually write a poem for you. And say you were to try and patent that poem, for example, you know, I know it's, you know, apples and oranges, but whatever the output is, how did that come from, right? There wasn't a human behind that. As a human, you know, there's a bunch of people at Google that put together this algorithm to make this thing happen. But it'd be very difficult to assign that to a living and breathing person, I think. Yeah, and that's the debate is, you can have an invention, a patent invention that has joint uh, inventors in it, meaning, you know, more than one. So therefore, the question becomes, you know, if you have at least one human inventor, can you list an AI as like a second inventor? That question is still up for grabs, but, you know, that certainly puts one foot in the the realm of, okay, so that's, that's possibly statutory. And so there's actually a, a very interesting case that's informative for what's happening here. And it, it actually occurred in the 1800s, the late 1800s, and it had to do with cameras. And you know, I think this would be interesting to talk about with the audience here. So I'll make an analogy. So, you know, in the late 1800s, um, you know, photographs were becoming more popular and this was a copyright related case, but the question became, well, if you're a person using operating a camera and you just push a button and a picture, a portrait is generated, you know, well, who actually owns the copyright to that? Is that the camera? Did the camera do it? Or did the person pushing the button do it or both, something like that? And so, of course, nowadays it's, it's fascinating to think about this because we don't think about, we think about the, you know, the photographer, right, that takes the photo. That's the copyright holder, no question. But back in, uh, you know, 100 or so years ago, there was a similar question um, as to, you know, hey, a machine is, is painting this picture. You know, is it really the machine or is it the person? And so what the Supreme Court said in that case that began with Barrow Giles basically is that the person could be considered the copyright holder because he or she was uh, responsible for moving the camera around to select the scene, the possible lighting, you know, and all of these other creative aspects that go into, you know, capturing a, a photograph. So here, a similar argument can be made in that a computer scientist or other, other person, you know, in this field could, you know, for an AI-related invention, could select training data right? And depending on how they supervise that training data for a, a supervised learning type um, methodology or, you know, invention, then, you know, that person would be the inventor of, you know, whatever model or, you know, whatever device that used that model uh, would be because they had a uh, hand in crunching or applying or manipulating that training data before it occurred or whatever process. You could also talk, use the same type of analogy for unsupervised or reinforcement learning as well. So, you know, those types of things, if you wanted to talk about the difference between, you know, fully 
machine invention versus a you know half and half human plus machine invention. Those types of things would come up, which are really quite fascinating that that we're at this point now that that can be done. Yeah, absolutely. So it feels to me like it's really the creativity or the person that actually, like you said, created the training data and ran it through the machine. They're the ones who can legally own this patent. And really, the computer is just sort of a machine in this. It's it's like it's like a car, right? The car doesn't go anywhere. It takes a human to get in it and drive it around and point in the in, in like the right direction. Is that that's kind of what it feels like? The sort of similar analogy. Yeah, that's exactly right. And in fact. You know, if we were, let's say you and I were going to talk about, you know, patenting your AI related invention, you know, one of the things that we would talk about was like, okay, well, what's, you know, is this a supervised, you know, most inventions are supervised uh, and most AI related technologies or inventions or applications are supervised anyway. So we'd probably have a discussion about what your training data looks like. What are you using? What's your data set? You know, how many inputs does it have? You know, how many columns? You know, what are your hyperparameters? Stuff like this. Like, how, how are you pushing this into the, you know, some type of AI related algorithm? Is this a neural net? Things like that. And so once we have that down, that would be an element of our patent claim. And therefore, you would automatically be an inventor because you would have told me at least one element of the claim and you would have contributed to that, which is, you know, the magic formula for, you know, naming you as an inventor. Other steps in the, that claim process, and there's kind of a, a yeah, magic one, two, three process uh, for claiming any AI related invention, at least in the supervised learning category, is that you want to describe you know, the, your training data that you're using. You want to describe how, in fact, you're training your model. And then you want to also describe how you're using your model in some type of predictive or classification sense for some type of end use. A very popular one is an autonomous driving vehicle. So you'll have a model or, you know, one or more models that are trained that are put in type of some type of autonomous vehicle or a robot that can be used to steer or drive or direct that robot, you know, an environment. And so that's pretty much how your claim would look. And you can use that same claim strategy to describe your improvement, which we talked about before, so we can satisfy the Supreme Court's test in the Alice case. And so once we kind of line all those things up, you know, where you're the inventor plus where, you know, we're able to demonstrate the improvement and where we're uh, properly describing the AI related invention from, let's say, a supervised uh, machine learning aspect. Uh, you could do the same thing for a reinforcement or a GAN or unsupervised learning example as well. But once we have all those things lined up, then you're in a good spot for patenting your AI related invention. Yeah, absolutely. It feels like I guess, just, so just step back for a second, you know, as you're an attorney and you're probably watching all the patents that are being issued, you probably have, you know, clients that are submitting stuff and working on stuff in this sort of AI, IoT world. Feels like better data will lead to better models. Are there other areas of improvement or, adv- or advances like in, in general that you're seeing? Or is it really like people just sort of making these models better and getting better data? Are those the types of patents that are happening these these days? Or those are the types of intellectual property claims that are happening? Or are there other areas where like, no, this is really interesting. People don't know about this, but since I'm sort of watching all the stuff going on, there's another area where we're sort of seeing a lot of big leaps and changes in technology. And it could be an AI, honestly, it could be an internet of things. It could be in any other area, but I'm just sort of curious based on your perspective of what you're seeing going on in the legal landscape, what's sort of coming across your desk that you're like, wow, this is kind of cool. And I know you can't talk about, you know, anything that would be under NDA or thing like that, but I'm just wondering if you have any sort of like general observations. Yeah, absolutely. And that's an excellent question. And I'll answer at a very high level for the reasons that you laid out. But basically, I'll say something like this, like 99% of the AI related patent inventions that we see and that other firms have seen when you know talking to other patent attorneys at other firms are use of existing AI related algorithms and open source software such as Google TensorFlow or Facebook's PyTorch or you know, Python SkyKit Learn or something like this, use of those to do something with. So most inventors are not interested, or at least, you know, their inventions do not involve going underneath the hood and tweaking the AI, you know, algorithm itself. They're more interested in using the -the off-the-shelf open source packages in order to do something with. And so, again, a lot of times you'll see that the, the real novelty in the inventions is the specific selection of the training data and how the the model is trained. And, you know, one of my favorite definitions of machine learning is from Jan McCombs, Facebook's AI head, 
he defines it. He says machine learning is the science of sloppiness, which I absolutely love being a computer science myself. Because pre-AI days, you know, you would write a program and it'd be very procedural. You know, you'd have step one, step two, step three, a bunch of if-then-else statements. Maybe you have like an expert system that, you know, went through all these different permutations of data flows and flow charts and stuff like this in order to, to get to a decision. Now, you know, fast forward where we get, you know, more powerful machines and computers and, and bigger data and we're able to do AI on a massive scale. Not that AI wasn't, you know, around before. It's been around since the 1950s, but we've, you know, now arrived at a point where we have the compute power to do it. But but now, you know, we can kind of flip instead of like some, you know, flowing program that I just described. Now you have, let's just take all the data, push it through an AI algorithm, come up with a model, and we're going to use that to make decisions instead of having some very specific heuristic flow diagram of how things are going to be determined. And so you know, hence the, the definition of the science of sloppiness. You can be a little sloppy and just say, hey, I got all this data. I'm not 100% sure what it's going to explain or what, or if this will actually be predictive, but you can keep training and keep training and keep tuning and keep tuning your, your model until you get something that's highly predictive or, or something that's very useful for classifying or, or whatnot like this. And, and those are the types of inventions that we see. Now, that 1% of invention, the other type is the stuff where they go underneath the hood they say like, well, the, the current algorithm is not as effective because it does this, or we need to add something to it. And then you start talking about typically augmenting some mathematical step that's happening in the AI training. Maybe there's a back propagation step. Maybe there's, you know, some type of different, you know, weighted step. Maybe there's adding more, you know, hyperparameters or, or something like this. And so, you know, those types of inventions, while clearly in the AI space, because you're actually touching the underlying AI algorithm, those are more rare. More people are just using AI as, you know, you would use a processor, for example, to do any software-related program. Every software-related program pushes instructions through a processor. And so people are doing, you know, the same thing with open source AI platforms in that, that similar capacity. Yeah, it makes sense. It feels to me like I've always thought of software as like just like little Legos, I guess. And you're, you're assembling pieces together and somebody can make, you know, an animal out of Legos and somebody can make, uh, you know, a building out of Legos if they want. And so it feels to me like it's a different assembly, I guess, of the inputs and outputs that you're talking about that maybe make them distinct and unique in these cases, not the underlying algorithms that are used under the hood most of the time. Yeah, 100% agree. One of my favorite toys was Legos uh, back in the day. And I think of software similarly, especially now, given the many, many different APIs, AI being you know, one of them, the AI packages provided an API into the AI world. And so absolutely, you see people assembling things from an AI package or maybe an IoT or everything nowadays, instead of building software from scratch, is you're combining a lot of different APIs or, you know, quote unquote, stacks, you know, so you can have a platform or a device very quickly. Yeah. And so I, I think this thought just sort of came to mind was, you know, I think we're thinking about artificial intelligence and a lot of these pads that are being done in the positive sense. You know, I don't know you working on IP, but I just don't know if you deal with at all or you have your finger on anything going on with the deep fakes, right? So any of this other stuff of people saying, yes, I'm using it for a negative way, but is there, I mean, are there deep fakes that you know of that have been patented or that there's trademarks on or anything like that? Are you, are you aware or watching some of that stuff at all? I have not done anything that involved the use of the term deepfakes itself. I certainly know what they are. And um, I certainly have patented and familiar with a lot of virtual reality, augmented reality, and graphical user interface type patents. I don't think a, an inventor would, would call their own invention a deepfake. But in that same realm, you know, where you're, you're doing things such as you know, graphical manipulation to map somebody's face onto somebody else's face or things like this, that's all in the, the same, you know, wheelhouse of AI. And so could somebody get a patent on that? Yes, if they did, it would probably be, you know, dressed up more in like the, you know, again, the VR, AR, GUI space. It'd be interesting to see how they would uh, use that patent, you know, coming out the gates. A lot of times, you know, for those types of patents that I have seen, especially now, you know, post-COVID, people are interested in those from a consumer product perspective, such as, let me try on the product, you know, from the comfort of my own home virtually versus having to go to a store and try on something, you know, such as like a pair of sunglasses or things like this. So, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I wasn't sure if there have been any legal rulings that have come down around malicious use of, well, I guess in general, probably anybody can use a patent in a malicious way, I guess, right? 
Yeah, they can. Um, there's there's a whole body of law on patent misuse out there. For example, you can't get into antitrust issues if you happen to have a whole patent thicket, as we call it, which is just a bunch of patents, and you're asserting those in a, a way that would cause harm to consumers by inflating prices, things like this. Those are rare uh, most of the time, which you will see in the news for patents misuse, or at least you know what's fun to talk about is patent trolls, which are individuals that don't make anything. They don't have an entity per se, but they, they buy patents as assets and they use them to assert the patents against companies that do make products. And the Apples and Googles and Microsofts of the world you know, spend a lot of money defending those types of cases year in and year out. And so there's a real interesting, I, I suppose it's a political debate to be had about, which is an area that I, I like to stay far outside of, but there is a debate to be had as like, you know, Okay, if anybody can get a patent, you know, inventors, that's a good thing. But what happens when they get in the hands of the trolls, per se, which non-practicing entity is a polite way to, to call them? You know, what happens when they get these patents and now they're, you know, it's no longer the inventor. It's, you know, a third party that owns the patent because they bought it from the inventor asserting these things. You know, you know how do we solve that? And so it, it becomes an interesting discussion on both sides. Yeah, very cool. Just a couple more questions, I guess, as we're getting kind of near the end. But, you know, I like to ask people about just artificial intelligence, sort of machine learning and stuff like that, taking over people's jobs in the future. And I've known of a couple people that have created algorithms to look for patents. So they actually, I think, I'm, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but I know they were actually looking across a wide swath of various patents that have been granted and then essentially trying to figure out which person or which entity is probably the most patentable entity here. And so it was a pretty interesting project that they've been putting together. It feels to me like, obviously that is something that somebody could have done in software 15, 20 years ago. It would have been a lot more difficult though. And I'm just wondering from your standpoint, where do you see your job, I guess, the job that you do on a daily basis, enhanced, harmed, maybe it's negligible, but like, you know, do, do you see your job being impacted at all by this technology coming out? Yeah, I mean, that's a question for everybody. I think jobs that are highly cerebral, intellectual property being one of them, are pretty safe for a while. In my opinion, I could be totally wrong. But I think that, you know, the amount of detail and nuances that go into preparing a patent application to be successful in a bunch of different legal ways uh, would be very difficult to train a machine to do. Like right now, as we sit here, you know, machines using AI can be trained to do amazing things such as, you know, I'm thinking of AlphaGo, you know, being the, the Go masters of the world and, you know, other things like this. But, you know, when you think about it, these specifically trained AIs are really good at mainly doing one thing. And that's the thing that they've been trained for. So because IP involves doing many, many, many things layered on top of each other, uh, I think it'll be quite some time before an AI system can come out to kind of do everything. For example, you mentioned, you know, searching for, let's say, you know, specific patents, let's say prior art or you know, predicting the value of patents. Um, you know, that's been, you know, attempted to be done, you know, many, many different ways over, you know, decades. And now even, you know, using AI, the, even the most recent ones that come out, you know, there's still not as good as as the ones that we've had in the past. So it still remains a very difficult problem. I have thoughts on how, you know, it could be done as well. You know, would it be successful or more successful than previous projects that have to do these things? You know, probably not. You know, of course, you, you can automate some things here and there, but building a company around like a, a single, you know, automation of one aspect of IP law is just too expensive and probably you know, not worth it at the end of the day there, you know, I get lots of emails from individuals every day having a new platform that does one thing, but, you know, I really don't need that one thing I need. If you're going to like push the button and have the patent like spit out of, uh, you know, we're, we're far off from that world. What about on the other side of it, you file a patent and there's a patent examiner that's assigned. Could the examiner or maybe the patent office already does this? Do you think when somebody files something, you think there's a automation process that happens? Again, just purely speculative, but they must get so many patents. They do. And in fact, they're exploring the use of AI right now and something that they do quite often, which is called patent searching. And so what the patent office primary job is from a high level is making sure that, you know, no bad patents get out, get issued. And so an examiner, a patent examiner, which is the person that will review any patent filing that you file with the patent office, 
their primary job is to look at, you know, your claims, your patent claims, which will define what you have invented and to compare that to the quote unquote prior art. And the prior art is nothing more than previous patents that have already been filed, published, issued patents, and then publications out there in the known world, such as, you know, let's say an IEEE publication or a standard or even a newspaper article or, or something like this. And so what they do is they have two databases that they search called East and West. And basically their searches, and you'll get your search list in your file wrapper, which is the kind of a history of everything that has um, occurred throughout the prosecution of your patent application. And it will show how the examiner searched. And right now, when you look at it, it's a bunch of and and ors, like tradition, bullion, searching. There'll be a ridiculously long statement of this term and that term or that term and this term and you know all kinds of different permutations. And so what the, the patent office is trying to do right now is automate that process or make it better by using AI, which will include, of course, you know, some type of linguistic AI or natural language processing where certain words are known to be synonyms for others and you know they won't have to use the and and ours for specific words. They can, you know, the AI invention will presumably do that for them and spit back prior art references that the examiners can look at. And what they do is they compare the prior art reference to your claims. And if there's a match, they're like, well, somebody else has already invented this. So you can't be the inventor of this because it's already been invented. And so you go back and forth with the patent office to either argue against that or to amend your claims to add in something new where you're able to say, well, okay, maybe that has already been invented. But when I add this additional aspect, then you know all of this stuff together has been invented. And so Perhaps AI in the future will help examiners with that process. And I, I think it will. I think that that's the lowest hanging fruit and the easiest one to for the, the patent office and others to target because there's a treasure trove of data and you know natural language processing has existed for a while, which can be easily applied to the text of prior art references out there. Yeah, interesting. My mind started going to this idea of essentially AIs going against AIs, you know, or chatbots going against chatbots, right? So you have a patent examiner that's run by one algorithm and you have an inventor that's run by another algorithm and they're just ping-ponging back and forth, right? It's the interaction between these things that might be interesting in the future. We just sort of like let them go and find out, can you get your patent through? Who writes the best algorithm? Like a GAN of some type. I would love to see like a general adversarial network GAN. I, I would love to see what would be spit out of that GAN. That would be um, quite fascinating. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the patent thing would come back, the officer would come back and say, because of this, you can't. Okay, well, why don't you try this? And then, so yeah, funny. Well, cool. Cool, man. We've covered a lot today, Ryan, for sure. Is there anything else you wanted to touch on that maybe I missed around IP and AI and IoT? No, I think we did a, a good job at exploring all of that. I guess the only other thing I'll say is we've been talking about patents mostly, but you know, there are, of course, the other forms of IP out there as well. The, the big one for AI being copyright, where, you know, if you have a, a unique training data set, then the arrangement or selection of that data for pushing into a training model could be copyrightable and valuable. Because, you know, if you're able to get that data in a particular arrangement or ordering that's useful for generating a highly predictive model, that's something that that would be interesting. So just to add to that, the IP discussion, you know, in addition to patents, I, I'd like to add that, that one last point. Yeah, for sure. So it's basically, you know, you have some unique data that nobody else has, and that's something that could be copyrightable. Yeah, and a lot of companies are in the position where they are data rights, are they data owners, but they're not really good at AI. And so there has uh, arisen a question of how can these companies monetize that versus just handing it over to somebody else to build an AI product with, you know, and that company benefiting. So there's been a lot of licensing agreements between companies kind of teaming up where one has a data and the other one has the AI specialty. Nice. Sounds like from my standpoint, as long as it benefits the consumer, I think for everybody at the end of the day, if there's better products and services that are built, however they're built, and there's more competition and the prices come down, it's good for everybody. Exactly. How do people reach out to you? Are you hooked up on LinkedIn? I always have like, you know, links in, in, in the notes to this. So I'll definitely be sure to put a link off to your Patent Next website. But yeah, how do people reach out to you? Sure. And in, in various ways, you can find me on LinkedIn, Ryan Phelan. Um, I've come to find out that Ryan Phelan is a very common name. It seems like it's not original with respect to putting two Irish names together, Ryan and Phelan. So a good way is just to go to patentnext.com 
and you can subscribe to any um, future posts there. And it also has my contact information, such as on LinkedIn or at my firm website, uh, Ryan Phelan at Marshall Gerstein. You can reach out to me any of those ways. Happy to discuss with you know, members of the podcast. Excellent. All right. Well, great, Ryan. Appreciate your time. It's been a great discussion and uh, look forward to keeping in touch with you in the future. Okay. Thank you, Justin. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.